All right, hello everybody. Uh, my name is Ginny Barber. I'm the director of the Australasian Open Access Strategy Group. Welcome to this first webinar of 2021. Um, we are going to, uh, uh, just to let you know, we'll be recording this webinar. Um, so in the usual way, if you could all keep yourself muted and with your cameras off just for bandwidth, that would be fantastic as we go through. Um, we've got a lot of presence, uh, presentations and quite a lot to get through. Um, but we'll have time for questions at the end. So please do type questions into the chat um, and we will read out and respond to them um, at the end of the session. Uh, we'll finish on or just before the hour. And as I said, this recording and the slides will be up on our website uh, shortly afterwards. So first of all, I'm going to hand over to Martin Borshit, the chair of the uh, Open Access Strategy Group um, to kick us off. Good morning, everybody. It's great to have so many people joining us today. I'd just like to start uh, with an acknowledge of the Gadigal and Bedical peoples here in Sydney, um, who are the traditional owners of the land where UNSW um, here is located. Um, I'd also like to pay my respects to El also to elders um, and also extend uh, that uh, respect uh, to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people who are joining our meeting today. Um, so if you haven't, um, 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 if you haven't met me before, um, it's nice to meet you online. Um, so I, I'm the chair uh, of the executive group of the AOASG, which is an organization where we have membership from 20 of our universities in Australia and all eight universities in New Zealand. We've also, um, we also have an affiliate uh, membership, which is also with like the you know, CC Australia um, and also with like the you know, Toa in New Zealand. So uh, today we're going to hear an overview uh, of what happened last year in 2020, uh, which is from the perspective of the AOASG. We hope you will find that interesting and, and helpful. And we've got a short series of talks uh, from the executive committee members, um, which will be on specific initiatives at their institutions. So I'll just start by introducing each of the executive team members. And as we do, I'll just get you to turn your camera on and say hello. Uh, I'd just like to also extend my thanks to all of the executive team members for doing a lot of work and doing it really, really well and bringing their expertise to the organisation. Fiona Burton is, is here from the Macquarie uh, University. Wave, Fiona. Thank hello. You. Hello. <laughs> And then we will introduce you to Donna McCrosty from University of Melbourne. Hello. Introduce you like to like you know, Scott Nichols from University of Western Australia. Good morning. And I will introduce you from Anne Scott from Christchurch University, Tewa Wananga Awatara. Mm -hmm. And then there is like the Yep, thank you. And lastly, there is like a Maureen uh, Sullivan, who is, who is here from Griffith University. Thanks, everybody. Thank you very much. And uh, we'll hear from these people uh, with some institutional perspectives in a moment. So uh, I'm now going to hand over back to Ginny, who's going to give you the report on 2020. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Martin. Um, so I'm going to do a lightning tour through uh, what's been happening in open access uh, with the group uh, in 2020. Um, we've got plenty of time for questions at the end. So if you have any specific questions on what I'm gonna talk about, please do type them into the chat or um, get in contact with us afterwards. Um, and I'll also give a brief preview of uh, 2021. So um, I think it's fair to say that uh, uh, 2020 was really the year 
uh, when open access kind of became the norm uh, globally. Um, we know that we don't have to sort of reiterate to this group really, the importance of open access to all types of research became completely essential. And what became really clear was that it wasn't just the, um, the uh, the sort of normal things you might expect with a, a new emerging disease, such as the, the new initiatives around the coronavirus, but also old coronaviruses, and the things that might be to do with um, transmitted respiratory infections. But it became really obvious that, as we all know, that society changed very dramatically in 2020 and open access to a whole range of initiatives and um, knowledge just became completely essential. So, you know, things like how do you develop drive-through pharmacies at, at a quick, um, very quickly? How do you support athletes in lockdown? How do you change schools fundamentally? And it's pretty clear that there was an absolute outpouring of academic research across the entire world on all of these types of um, new initiatives and old initiatives and new knowledge and old knowledge and all of it had to be combined in a quite um, substantial way and we saw some really massive um, changes in the way that um, information and research was shared and made available. Um, I pulled out a few here but of course um, this was a massive global change in how we shared information and it's fair to say that it um, pretty much every organization, every publisher um, participated in, in their own way. The, probably the most important one was this CORD19 open research data set. That was um, an initiative which was initially coordinated by the um, Office, of Scholarly, uh, Office of Science and Technology Policy at the US White House um, that le has led to um, around 280,000 scholarly articles uh, as of uh, last week being openly available in this enormous database, database that is available for sharing and um, uh, use. What has become clear, however, is there were even issues around the sharing of this uh, research database in that, for example, not all the um, papers that are within it have the same license associated with it. And that, you know, is leading to potential issues uh, downstream. Um, as a result of some of the initiative the issues that came to light, the Open COVID pledge um, was uh, launched and that has been a really important way of um, uh, really holding uh, organisations to account on how they might work to share res research, not just now, but in, in the future. And some other initiatives that changed um, were, for example, preprints, which within within in the medical community really have, have perhaps not had the traction that they've had in other areas of, of scientific and academic research, just became an absolutely enormously uh, important part of sharing of information. And MedArchive was one of the primary places for sharing of this information. And you can just see on the right that um, really from the beginning of the pandemic uh, and, and continuing now, a large number of, po of uh, preprints that are currently being posted up on MedArchive and indeed on other servers are related to COVID-19. And it seems like that's going to change, I think, how publishing happens uh, really consistently um, in the future. And uh, obviously associated with it is massive usage. And I know it's very small on this, but you, but the numbers on the on the uh, uh, the y-axis are high. You can the monthly downloads were sort of in the tens of uh, around 10 million for Med Archive, which was pretty enormous for the showing the use and reuse of academic research at this time. So what does it? What did the Open Access Group do? Well, um, I framed what the work that we did in 2020 around the, the four kind of pillars of our of the way that we work. So we have we work on advocacy, capacity building. Uh, we uh, put a high um, premium on collaboration and then raising awareness. And I'll talk to each of those briefly. So advocacy is both national and international, and there were some really big uh, events and initiatives that happened last year. So we um, we put in submissions to the UNESCO's uh, work on open science, and we attended a follow up meeting, and that work is continuing this year. Um, we supported a work that the uh, White House was going to do on um, a on a access to peer reviewed research. There was a hope that under the previous administration that there would be uh, a ruling on um, open access. Obviously we have a change of um, government there and that work is now continuing and we, um, we work very closely with Spark in the US on um, open access work um, that they're doing. Um, we put out statements on um, 
work on the COVID pandemic here in association with COOL. And um, we did other work that was also regional, for example, the APEC, OPEC Open Science Meeting. Um, and then a really important part of the work that we did last year was with COOL um, on an Australian national strategy, which included work on um, uh, included international consultations, some national discussions. We held two um, high level roundtables in June and December. And we also held two public webinars, one with an international panel, one with a national panel. And we had a, a very entertaining unconference session at the AMOS uh, conference at the end of the year, all of which was around socializing the idea of moving towards a national strategy on open research, which includes open access, but also takes a wider perspective. Uh, we had a lot, did a lot of work on capacity building. This is really important to us. Um, last year was the first time that we had a formal practitioners group as part of the AOASG. Um, and they did some fantastic work on journey mapping, developing personas. Uh, we had a group that looked at curation of OA resources, not just from um, work that we've done, but also from institutions across Australia and internationally. And we also did some work on development of FAQs. And all of these, this work will be going on to our new web, new website, um, which will be a key piece of work for this year. Um, and we also supported communities of practice, both in Australia and New Zealand. Um, the Australian one meets monthly, the New Zealand one is now managed from a group there. And both of these are active um, participatory groups um, which cover a wide range of topics um, at each meeting and if you're interested in knowing more about those I'd encourage you to get in, in touch with me. Um, we did a lot of work with collaboration so these I've uh, this is this is just a summer example of some of the groups that we uh, talked with. Um, some of this work that was was initiated by us and some of it was um, groups coming to us to work on specific um, uh, initiatives and for, so, so for example some of our work uh, is around um, raising awareness of the work that others are doing so that would be true for SCOS this sustainable coalition for open science um, and the invest in open group and some of it is actually developing helping develop policies or developing specific initiatives or um, resources so that a lot of this work will be ongoing we tend have to be quite mindful of who we work with uh, simply often because of time but also we we make very sure that whoever we work with is is aligned with the the work that we're trying to do uh, in Australia and New Zealand um, and then last year was a really big year for raising awareness in all sorts of different ways we ran a whole series of webinars again some of them were ones that we initiated and some were ones that um, we participated in with others um, we covered everything from um, responsible research assessment through to SCOS through to um, uh, advocating in the pandemic which was a highly entertaining um, uh, session at the Open Publishing Fest, which itself was a sort of really new way of publishing, um, of, of doing a, a, a open, um, an open uh, session, which we, we, we saw last year are really innovative ways that people were sharing information and we we got involved in as many of those as we as we could um, and then right at the towards the end of last year in September we had a session which we hosted on behalf of Coalition S um, a very well attended session which laid out the work that they were doing particularly around their retaining rights strategy on um, access um, to research uh, retaining copies of um, uh, research within repositories um, so other things that we did, we had the opportunity to write for the conversation. We wrote a piece for the Australian Academy of Science, which um, has been uh, very well uh, used and uh, cited. Um, we were interviewed on radio, on uh, China Global Television Network, some, which was a slightly unusual um, uh, experience, but actually talked about the whole all of the work that was going on in Australia in relation to the coronavirus um, and all of these are just ways that we we try to get um, message about open access out there to as wide an audience as possible um, we obviously have a website which is in the process of being redeveloped and that will be work for, um, for next year in particular for this year in particular we have a list of, of uh, pandemic resources that we curated um, we worked in other ways. One of them, uh, Twitter is probably our most important way of getting out daily research, daily um, information, but we also have newsletters that come out monthly and we talk to, uh, we have met specific member updates. And then somewhat to my um, 
uh, surprise last year, last week, we got caught up in the Facebook um, issue and our site was one of the ones, uh, the sort of supposedly new sites that was uh, taken down by Facebook. Um, it, it is back up again uh, this this week I've, I've seen, um, I think, I suspect due to work that uh, Elliot Bledsoe um, did identifying a number of groups that have been inadvertently caught up in the Facebook um, uh, sort of takedown. But what it highlighted for me really was the importance of using a diversity of ways of getting out information um, across, as, across the board. And then I would say just our really big success for, for last year was Open Access Week 2020. This was the first time that we'd coordinated such a, a, a big set of events. We had 10 events across five days. We did two each day. The first one was a speaker and the second one was a workshop. Um, we had a fantastic group of um, practitioners who worked with us um, to uh, get this going. And it was truly diverse and I think very representative of um, issues within Australia and New Zealand. I will just say that the, the most, the best attended um, panels were ones uh, which focus very much on issues within in this region, particularly the Maori, Pacifica and Indigenous Perspectives panel. But we also had Susie Wiles, who, as um, many of the folk in New Zealand will know, what has been an incredibly important um, person for science communication across the pandemic there. And she gave a, a fantastic speech. So I think that we uh, envisage doing something similar this year. And I think it did spark a lot of interest in open access and the real diversity of initiatives that are happening. So um, what's happening in 2021? So just I've pulled out four things that I think we'll need to be thinking about. So the first off is that we need to really build on the initiatives around open access and make sure that it doesn't fade away when the pandemic comes under control. Um, this is a big year for Plan S. Um, it's the year that most of their policies came into effect and um, we're already beginning to see um, what that might mean for um, uh, compliance, not so much in Australia, but certainly globally, but there will begin to be effects seen globally because of the, um, the way that um, everybody is now going to have to be thinking about how um, work is made immediately available if you are part of a, um, a Plan S supported uh, project. Um, we do expect to see further national strategies happening um, and uh, we will particularly be keeping a close eye on the US with a new administration. And I think it's also fair to say that we are beginning to see a bit of work, a bit of publisher pushback, and that's going to be quite important to make sure that we are on top of that. Um, certainly some of it's not clear that um, all the work around that Plan S has done has translated into um, uh, collaboration with all the publishers. And so I think there'll be need to be consideration of what that means for um, academics, particularly within this region. Um, so what are we up to? So we've got a few things. Um, first is a big one for us is the website project, which will be coming very shortly. Uh, it'll have new look functionality, but also update of our advocacy resources. And we intend for it to be a definitive source of information for open access information in Australia, Australasia, which we already know that a large part of what is used there are some of our directories. And in fact, there was a piece in Campus Morning Mail just this morning, which talked about um, the repository list that we curate there. We'll be doing work or uh, we'll be doing webinars throughout the year. We'll be doing some targeted workshops, which we expect all to be online this year. And uh, we'll be um, in particular pursuing the policy work uh, with call. So I will stop there and I'm now going to hand over to uh, our executive committee who are going to take us through some of the initiatives at their, um, their universities. So first up, um, uh, we have uh, uh, Griffith Open Research. So Maureen is going. Maureen Sullivan from Griffith will be talking first. Thank you, Ginny. Can everyone hear me? Yeah, yes. we can. Thank you. Excellent. Thank you. Um, uh, before I start on the Griffith Open Research statement, I'd just like to reiterate some of the things that um, Ginny said. So, um, 2020 was certainly an interesting year um, for us our long held e-preferred collection strategy really came into its own um, and that allowed us to keep going, but also to um, extend the idea of open, openness and availability of resources. So it opened up a lot of conversations for us. It also allowed us to extend um, some of our skills um, across um, 
our frontline services staff who did a lot of work in cleaning up um, our records for our uh, repositories. So improved our repository records and upskilled our staff. In terms of the open research statement, um, this has been a long time coming. Griffith has not had um, an open access statement uh, or policy. Uh, we had a new uh, DVCR who started in 2019, uh, Mario Pinto, um, who has a, um, comes from Canada, has um, a, an interest in open access. So in 2020, the idea was that we would um, move towards some policy statements. Um, so we actually managed in November 2020 to get an open research statement approved by um, the research committee. Now, this was an entirely library-led open research statement. Um, we worked very closely with the Office of Research and the Dean's Research and also, I think importantly, with all different cohorts in the research um, cycle. So people who've been around for a long time, people who are just starting, students, everybody had um, a, some input into this. So it's really around um, putting out a statement that says that we care about open access and why we care about it. And I think most importantly for us, the reason that we got it across the line was the final um, statement, which is um, that it is uh, research which is open with the accompanying data as open as possible, but as closed as necessary, which allows us to have the proper conversations around how each discipline and each research project is managed. So that's only step one. So the statement is not an end goal, but it's an endorsement step. And it was very important to have that um, high level endorsement because of where Griffith had been previously, where it wasn't seen as important. Now we're starting to move into the next steps, which is we're developing a reference group, which will help develop some more policy and procedure. And this reference group is being led by Belinda Weaver, who is the manager of uh, Library Academic Engagement Services. Um, and the terms of reference you can read there, it's around trying to get as much collaboration and understanding about what the needs are um, and how people will best use this. Um, the proposal is then um, to divide, so we, we have um, 17 people who are interested in being on our reference group. And they are from all disciplines, from all stages of their careers. And I would also say all um, levels of commitment to open research. I think there's a couple in there who are in there to make sure that we don't go crazy. Um, we're going to divide them into different groups. So one group's going to look at barriers for their particular disciplines. Another group's going to identify issues with sensitive data. And another group is going to inform guidelines and processes for open data sharing. Um, and then they're going to work together and check each other's um, work. So that's how we're progressing our open research statement. And um, it's actually wonderful to see this. It's been a long time coming for Griffith. Um, can we move to the next slide, please? I don't know how to do that. <laughs> Thank you. Oh, down there, sorry. Um, and then um, I just wanted to highlight that there's just a, a recently released um, survey report from Call and Arms. Um, and this has been particularly helpful for us as well. So Griffith was one of a number of institutes um, and a shout out to Donna at University of Melbourne. Um, who were highlighted as leading the way for having developed best practice pathways and processes to support their institution's open research requirements. And there's a list of the things that they thought that we had done well. All of those things are library led initiatives that we have been um, pushing forward with without necessarily having an um, endorsement from the research office or having um, a policy. So one of the thing that, things that the survey found was that we had great pathways and um, excellent information, but we were lacking in policy. Um, and now that that um, survey founding has come out, the Office of Research is really keen to develop some policy. 
um, which is great. So um, we're starting to really see some movement in this area, which is um, having a, an overarching statement that has endorsed open research and all of the open access issues that come under that. And given the library um, the impetus to be able to go out and lead in this space in a way that's going to lead us forward and as well bring in all the different people who need to think about this for their different stages and dis different disciplines. So we're really very excited. Um, if you're interested, have a look at our, our pages, see what we've done. Um, and, you know, uh, it's all led by our academic engagement researcher services. So that's all I wanted to say. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much, Maureen. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Martin to talk about UNSW activities. Thanks very much, Ginny. Uh, so I wanted to just talk about some ways uh, that we're advocating for open access myself, but also some of the projects that we're doing around that. Next slide, please. Um, what I've been doing is, uh, is having the library, you know, uh, with lots of people actually are contributing to papers that go to research committee and academic board, academic quality committee, and also to faculty boards. Um, talking about OA and the benefits, what's happening around the world, especially what's happening um, in all of the European nations with Plan S, and just reflecting and having conversations um, in these committees uh, with the membership there. And we've been doing that through writing a paper. Um, there are often slides as well, that which I would talk to for a presentation to have this as a discussion. And what that's been good for is, is that it keeps the topic alive. Um, it allows for people uh, to also give stories about their own experience and to reflect and to ask any questions. And I think having people in the room and talking about all the disciplinary issues has been really, really interesting um, and helpful as well. So working with these groups, um, we've been doing an OA report as part of the library report to research committee, really for every meeting um, and it's updates. We draw some of the AOSG update information and other sources and put it together. Uh, just to give the impression and show how much is happening here around the world and that, uh, which I think UNSW needs to think about. Um, also every year or two, um, I've also been invited or have asked um, to give a presentation on OA which is an academic board. Um, so that's a much broader audience as well. So it's a really good way to have those conversations. Um, at those two meetings, uh, at, at a paper we did not that long ago, we had, I think, an action list to talk through as well and to get some endorsement. And that's the list of items on the right there. Um, we've had a policy on OA for um, about three years now, but it's time to refine it and update it. Um, we're doing work in our repository to update the infrastructure um, using like a DSpace uh, 7, which is very new. Um, we've also been doing uh, work with early career um, with academics and HDR candidates on, you know, to help them with it to help them with uh, their publishing for success. Uh, we've been talking about Plan S and how we can align um, the importance of retaining rights using Creative Commons license. Um, we've been talking about really that the repository infrastructure is diverse and um, we need to know um, where our authors are putting their material around the globe in these systems. Also maybe to, uh, to help in also uh, to help inform harvesting in the future as well. We still need to do some work on the deposit rate, uh, which is increasing, um, has been for quite some years now, but there's still more work to do. Um, we did some, we also had a proposal uh, to do a pilot, which would be uh, for funding for article processing charges. Um, last year and this year, the budget is very different now. So we've put that on hold at the moment. But we have been doing um, work also where we're estimating the cost of article processing charges using the call methodology um, and 
just explaining what's going to happen is we move from read only agreements into publish and read agreements. We've also talked about culture uh, in research. And um, you know that's a much, much bigger issue than really just the library as well, but it was certainly one of the topics. Next slide, please. Actually, on that last slide, I just wanted to say too um, that the library also did a paper talking about the issues of textbook availability, especially with ebook textbooks uh, going to university. Uh, so we sent, um, we had a discussion there that went at the Quality Committee and Academic Board explaining to the professors on the boards, you know, um, often the problem we see in libraries that the commercial publishers will restrict the availability of the ebook versions of textbooks to us, which is an amazing thing to hear about really. Um, and the timing of that, uh, we made that one of the OA week uh, topics, well, I did uh, with the university committees as well. So they could see the impact also on learning and teaching. And then we talk about all these issues as well as the faculty boards, and it's a good opportunity um, to ask any questions and have them answered. Sorry, next slide. So I wanted to mention that uh, with the Institutional Repository UNS Works, um, we've been doing some uh, work uh, to uh, change uh, the system behind um, with what we have, also moving into DSpace 7. Um, that's of course a multi-year project when you go through procurement and implementation. Um, you know, we are really excited to be working with DSpace 7 um, in the future. We're wanting to use it, I think we want to broaden the usage, uh, which will also include like the you know, data um, um, as well as publications, NTROs and theses. We think it's going to uh, really helped to improve the user experience on both sides as an author and, and also as a user. And, um, you know, I'm interested, um, I think, increasing the harvesting um, through the research management system that we're using as well. Um, also, it'll help with the other aspects which we can to. Next slide, please. Um, so, at UNSW, uh, we review all our policies every three years, I think. So we're up to reviewing also the open access policy. Um, I think for a first go policy, it's been pretty successful. Uh, we've done a lot of nuancing on wording, uh, working with governance, also with council. Um, I'm interested in the, uh, I'm also very interested in the timing of deposit. Uh, we had 12 months, maybe we'll move to immediate. Um, I'm interested in the harvesting side of, of that as well. I think that can be very, very powerful. And some other things we've been doing, talking about um, here at UNSW um, is working like you know, with Scope 3, uh, which is the physics OA publishing ecosystem. Um, we've also done Publish and Reader with CSIRO. Um, we're starting to look at PLOS uh, um, at the new site license system called CAP. Uh, of course, we've been working with SCOS. And we've also been working like, you know, with Kofi too. So, you know, there's a lot to discuss there with the academics and with the university community, but um, I see that um, as the role. And that's it. Thank you very much. Hand over to the next person. Great. Thanks very much, Martin. Okay. I'm now going to hand over to Donna McCrosty from University of Melbourne. Okay. Um, thank you, Ginny. And um, thank you all. I would like to firstly acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from the lands of the Wurundjeri and pay my respects to elders past and present. So today I'm going to spend a few minutes taking you through some of the initiatives and communication activities that have followed the endorsement of a, an open access principles to research output. And it's going to be an absolute whistle stop tour. So um, it'll be very quick. So next slide, Ginny. First thing I wanted to do was to provide you some context. So during 2018 and 19, the library was leading a, a broad uh, consultation with the academic divisions to refresh the scholarly information strategy for the next five years. So during those conversations, there was a uh, open access was raised on a number of occasions in a number of contexts. And it was clear there was an uneven understanding of this opportunity too, but Plan S was something that was front and center of everybody's mind. 
So in collaboration with the research leadership and sponsored by the Pro Vice Chancellor Research Capability, the library led a project of engagement and consultation with the Academy to develop an open access position at the university. And we were very ably supported by Danny Kingsley, who many of you will know as a quite a deep expert in this space as well. So like Griffith, we work very closely with key committees, um, ensuring the opportunity was there to open the conversations and input into the discussion around open access. So consultation um, commenced in August 2019 and by December 2020, the university executive and the academic board had endorsed the principles for open access to research outputs. And for those who are familiar with the machinations of governance at the university, that was actually lightning speed. Um, and we were very pleased that that happened. It was at the right point in time to formalize the university's commitment by a set of principles. And it was shepherded through the process from the university executive and academic board by the DVC research. So we had a lot of support from the research leadership as well. So next slide, um, Jim. So in early 2020, the task was now to sort of increase awareness of the principles, as it was noted at academic board that the broad dissemination and socialization of the principles was really important moving forward. So again, we worked hand in glove with the research leadership to ensure we engaged um, key committees like CADRE, which is the Committee of Associate Dean's Research in the discussion and planning while we were developing a communication plan. And that focused on um, awareness and understanding of the principles across the research community, but particularly the research support staff and looked at strengthening the relationship with the support staff within the faculty. So the outreach to the researchers can be tailored to each of the discipline needs. Um, also increasing, uh, another focus was on the increasing the rate of deposit into our open access um, repository as well and availability of that, that full text, but also through our initial com uh, conversations and consultations prior to the development of the principles, it was clear we needed to increase literacy around scholarly communications as well. So that was a key focus as well. So where are we now? All faculties are aware of the open access principles. However, our communications um, on the website is more focused on the value of open accesses to the researcher and to the community rather than the compliance message, which we found quite successful. Um, with 2020 pretty much being a pivot to digital, our, all our face-to-face -face communication strategies had to pivot to digital well as well. And as Jenny, uh, Jenny indicated previously, Twitter has actually been quite a successful um, communication mechanism for us. And in the Open Access Week, um, a social media campaign received over 110,000 impressions, proving that our Twitter account is a good medium for um, research oriented content as well. We're also developing a whole range of training sessions that have been very well attended online. And that has now led to a sort of a quarterly open research session for 2021. Uh, next slide, Jin. So running in parallel to the communications plan too is a, a schedule of works to improve the systems and services that facilitate open access. During the conversations we had, there were a lot of pain points that, um, and touch points on the academic community uh, that we needed to alleviate and look at and really focus on as well. And this was critical to the success moving forward. So we've made a range of improvements and workflow improvements have been initiated through this um, last nine months as well. This includes repository team ownership over seeking publisher permissions rather than referring back to faculties for follow up as well. We have a distributed system at the moment where um, faculties follow up um, from query from um, issues that have found by the central library team. So we needed to smooth that process because it had led to inconsistent levels of follow up across the university. So we're hoping to um, relieve a pain point there as well. We're also um, piloting an on request service to um, mint DOIs for OA reports in Minerva Access, which is our institutional repository, and hoping to expand this to support UOM journals in 2021. And next slide, Jim. 
So bulk harvesting, again, the operational efficiencies, um, we had an aim to sort of build a comprehensive collection in the university open access repositories. So again, we went back to the key committees to socialize a, um, an opportunity to do bulk harvesting of PDFs through the repository where its CC license can be found. And that the prime aim was to increase compliance with ARC and NHMRC mandates as well, but also in enhance discovery of our publications because our publications are visible through our find and expert profiling that the university does of our academic community as well. So this increased that visibility and discoverability. So to date, there has been 10,000 files harvested and that content is now available. And through 2020, publications harvested via unpaywalled is um, undertaking, uh, is, is being undertaken at the moment. Um, and the, the team of, of finding this is probably a, a more difficult uh, because it's from different uh, publishers. And at the moment, I think there's harvested about 700 papers in 2020. Uh, it was a more manual process to do matching files. However, it's still quick, uh, much quicker than manually downloading papers and we'll continue to refine how we do that um, and see how we go forward with that. It is still a learning process um, and, and we'll move forward with that as we go. So next slide, Ginny. Uh, reporting through the OA monitor as well. So the bulk harvesting also helps ensure our OA monitor is reflective of our gold OA as well. So the funder filter is now more accurate as we are receiving grant publication links through dimensions as well. Again, something that is a, a work in progress. And um, next slide. Again, that, that, that was very much a whistle-stop tour and um, Dumity Flanagan and Eleanor Collinor, who, Colla, sorry, who lead our open scholarship um, team have done a lot of this work and are investigating other key initiatives as I said, it is a learning process and they're very happy to um, answer any more queries of detail. Thank you. Great, thanks very much, Donna. Um, I'm gonna hand over now to Scott Nichols from the University of Western Australia. Thank you, Ginny. Um, I'm speaking from my Jagnogal land and uh, I pay my respects also to the elders past, present and emerging. Uh, today, I wanna to talk to you just about one project, one small project that we've been running here at UWA, which we started planning for in 2020. Um, and we're just about to kick off. Um, in the project, what we're aiming to do is to identify how we might deliver a more tailored and discipline specific support model for open access, especially to the humanities. And um, this project, I think, gives some insights into some of the challenges around um, open access engagement with the university. Um, just to give you some background, so um, during Open Access Week in 2020, which was highly successful, we heard from um, Ginny around some of the activities that AISG did. Um, some of you may have seen a, a tweet from a well-known digital humanities researcher named Tim Sherratt. So Tim had done some analysis of articles published in the Australian Historical Studies Journal uh, between 2008 and 2018, and uh, found that the open access title, or the open access number or amount of open access was extremely low. I think it was around about 9%. Um, and this was despite the publisher allowing AAMs to be deposited and made openly available um, after an 18 month embargo. Um, and in one of the tweets uh, that Tim made, he made a great point, which is down the bottom of that slide, that historians get worked up about online access to primary sources in GLAM organisations. So why shouldn't they also take some responsibility ensuring that the products of their own research are, um, are not locked behind paywalls? which is, a, I think is a really good point. Now, um, uh, the tweet had been tagged in by or with professional uh, historical associations of which a number of our UWA uh, academics and historians belong. Uh, and as it turned out, there were a number of articles by UWA authors, which were in fact cited by Tim in his tweets. Um, so this of course generated a, a great deal of, of debate within the history discipline here at UWA around why uh, uh, they aren't more open. And as a result, the library had approaches from several researchers, including the head of discipline asking how they could increase their OA. Now I should point out at this stage that uh, here at UWA, we run a repository service using Pure, all of the 
WA authors um, who have publications ingested or added into that repository get automatically notified and uh, requesting copies of their AEM. Uh, we provide extensive liaison support, on, online information and training around open access. Um, and at a policy level, we, uh, we have built into our research integrity policy statements requiring UWA researchers to um, make their publications openly available in accordance with uh, fair principles. But despite all of that effort and all of those policies, um, there can still be a lack of traction with researchers around making their research open. And I think that's probably an experience that most of the people on this webinar have, have seen. So it was fantastic to see the impact uh, a prominent researcher within the discipline could have uh, when it came to prompting researchers to, to have more engagement with open access. And it's almost like that one tweet, at least in this instance, had more impact than all of our policy development over the last uh, five years. Um, next slide, Ginny. So after we were approached by the researchers, we were keen to um, see how we might leverage the interest, especially how uh, now that the head of discipline was keen um, to champion open access. And so what we decided to do was run a pilot project to explore what a tailored or a school uh, discipline approach to open access promotion would look and operate like. Um, so for the project, we're going to be working specifically with the discipline of history, but if it's successful, we'll look at um, other areas of the humanities. And the focus is on the humanities primarily because they just have, uh, seem to have a lower rate of open access than uh, other areas of the university. And the project has a number of quite simple um, activities that we're going to do. So first, we'll just use the repository to identify publications of the core academics um, in the discipline over the past several years. Um, and we're going to be looking at both journals and books. Um, we'll then track down the OA policy. Um, we'll um, typically be using Sherpa Romeo for the journals um, and we'll be looking at publisher websites for the book components. Uh, for information that's not recorded in Sherpa Romeo, so um, we think most of the book information um, won't be there. Um, we'll be recording that in a spreadsheet for future use and we're also going to look at how we might be able to share that in information with um, uh, other services as well. Um, uh, and then our library engagement staff are going to then uh, attend a discipline of history uh, meeting and explain information that we're going to be providing to the researchers um, along with what they need to do. Um, and included in that will be information about what an AAM is and um, how it can be made available in the repository and so on. Um, but what's going to be most important at that meeting is that there will be an introduction from the, the, the uh, head of the discipline who, who will talk about the importance of open access. And then finally, we'll send out those emails to the researchers with specific information around um, which of their publications uh, can be made openly available. So next slide, Ginny. So it's envisaged that um, uh, this would be a one-off process for the discipline. Um, so hopefully it'll help uh, educate those researchers so that they're aware of green open access um, for future publications. Um, the pilot's due to commence in March. And at the end of the project, we're hoping to establish, um, first of all, does this sort of tailored approach combined with the academic champion result in a greater uptake of group and green open access? And also how much work is involved in this approach and is it sustainable? Uh, so that's just one kind of project that, we're, that started last year that we're gonna be working on this year. Thanks, Jeannie. Great, thanks, Scott. Um, I'm now going to hand over to um, Anne Scott from the University of Canterbury to talk about initiatives at her university. Tēnā koutou katoa. Um, I'd just like to acknowledge Nai Tuhariri as the mana whenua of Waitaha. Waitaha. Um, I've chosen to talk about open textbooks today, but we are doing a whole range of open access things. Um, but in terms of, next slide, please, Jimmy. So uh, one back. Um, in terms of open access textbooks, um, we are seeing increasing demand for um, e-textbooks. And, and that's certainly the case since COVID moved our teaching and assessment online. The use of, um, of textbooks is declining, um, particularly for our younger academics. Um, and in some disciplines like the social sciences, um, where they're tending to move more to journal articles uh, on our online systems. Um, 
but we also have a, a significant number of textbooks that we also need to deal with. There's increasing evidence that students find textbooks cost prohibitive. Um, talking to our um, bookshop and various other places, it's clear that only around 25% purchase textbooks and that 75% rely on the library to provide the access. And then publishers are increasingly pushing models that really are not very satisfactory um, from the point of view of a student. Limiting user licenses, limiting copying and download, uh, particularly high costs coming through, um, costs that are sometimes now based on EFTs. Um, or in the case of New Zealand, where the market is really small, big international publishers are saying, actually, we're not going to provide any sort of e-copy, it's print only. The, uh, the um, environment that we're working on is also becoming increasingly complex. Uh, we've got micro-credentials, uh, we've got a whole lot of students who are now working overseas who were never working overseas before. Uh, we've got cross-institutional courses where the current licenses and copying and copyright are just not designed to cover this diversity. And we also have academics who have often written the textbooks um, who provide the New Zealand and Australian context. And many of them are very unaware of the issues and when you talk to them and you say, actually, we cannot provide access to your textbook at a, at a, a reasonable cost, even though you've written it to your student, for your students, um, that's just the, the uh, environment we're working on. So the library is fast re reaching a point where we can't provide e-textbooks e um, from some of the major commercial publishers and kind of Cengage and, P and Pearson sort of come to mind, but also LexisNexis and some of the others. And this is creating serious equity issues for our students. Next slide, please. So the library um, has been uh, involved in some research that's been happening. Um, it's led by Associate Professor Cheryl Brown here. Um, and the couple, next couple of slides that I'm going to show you is the University of Canterbury um, uh, outcomes from that research. Um, the New Zealand-wide research um, uh, results are not yet available. So if you have a look at this slide, um, there's some contradictions here. So at the bottom, um, students are saying that textbooks scaffold their learning. Um, but they also say they don't use the textbooks. And they say that access is an issue. And that access is a, and the biggest um, reason for that access issue is the cost of the textbooks themselves. So you, you can see that um, there's a contradiction there where um, actually students need the textbooks um, for various reasons they're not getting access. Next slide, please. So that slide is sort of uh, talking from a, a perspective of the academics, uh, actually as well the last slide and the, um, these, these are the colleges at University of Canterbury Science, Engineering, Education and, and Human Health, uh, Business, Law and Arts um, and this is um, the conversation about whether they're finding open textbooks, um, whether they know where to look for them, um, whether they don't know anything about them, um, whether they couldn't find a good open textbook or even whether they know what open textbooks are in the first place. So it's actually um, interesting that the science um, is the, has the most understanding and, and uh, know how to find open textbooks, um, going down to business and law, which has the, has the least. So this graph is showing that there is a big advocacy um, uh, thing for the library to take on, a big advocacy um, project for the library to take on to increase uh, our academics understanding of open textbooks and what they can do for them. Uh, next slide, please. So one of the things that um, uh, Fiona Tyson, one of our librarians has put together um, is this uh, graphic, um, which just talks about the pros and the cons of open educational resources um, and in comparison with the commercial education resources that are available. I'll, um, next slide, please. Um, some of the, so, so, so the, looking at the solutions, 
Um, what we really need to do is to raise awareness with our academics and within the institution on the situation, on the costs, on the access issues for our students and, and the equity issues. Um, one thing that we're seeing is that with COVID-19, we are this year um, getting more Māori and Pacifica students and first and family students. And so equity of, of access is really important. And we want to encourage our academics to use uh, more open textbooks or use journal articles instead. Um, and we also are starting to do some investigation on how to fund open textbooks with a focus on New Zealand material. Um, we might um, this year try to, we we're having conversations with a, a couple of our academics about the possibilities. Um, there are a whole lot of work to be done in this space. Um, and we need to in investigate what are the drivers um, for our academics choosing to go the closed publishing route. Um, the PBRF, um, the QS rankings, um, impact and how that is doing, um, how impact uh, from opening out these resources might um, uh, impact on these kinds of rankings. And also uh, the use of, of uh, things like MindTap and MyLab and other teaching aids um, that our ac academics are, are um, starting to use more and more. Also the, the fact that um, Cengage and Pearson are directly contacting our academics. Um, so we've got to be in that conversation at the right point in time. And the one thing that we need to do is to remember to celebrate, to celebrate our successes. Um, the, the, the both, um, we've just uh, managed to get a psychology 100 level course um, with an open access textbook and we will um, promote um, how that goes to our other academics because they're looking at actually what would happen if I went down the same route. Um, so thank you very much, that's a very quick Cook's tour and um, I look forward to seeing what happens in the next 12 months. Great, thanks very much, Anne. Um, I've realised we're almost at time, actually, so I'm not yeah. sure, Martin, whether we can cover any of the questions. Um, if you want, I can just pull out a couple of things that have been discussed in the chat, um, and then perhaps we can suggest that we can return to them at a later date. Yes, how about we just do two questions? Okay, be very quick. So the first one is some um, from Lookman Hayes at AUT. So Lookman talked about the the, it, the overall uh, question is around the publishers dictating the course of open access. So I just wondered if um, anybody would like to reflect on that. I can comment from I think our strategy at UNSW. Um, you know, you can see that we're trying to be involved in a whole lot of range of different business models and different solutions. Um, it's my personal opinion that one business model and solution won't get us to 100% OA within a short period of time. So I think the right thing to do at the moment is to learn as much as we can about every business model and solution and give a lot of things a go and, um, and see how they go. And certainly, you know, I think that with the brevity of my presentation, I had not covered all of those points individually fully. Yeah. Great, thanks, Martin. And then um, Danny uh, Kingsley had a question or a comment, really, which I think is really worth reflecting on, which is that um, should the can the impact agenda be seen as something that can align with align with the wider question of open in institutions? Is this a good way to increase engagement with research offices and add to the research portfolio? So, that, would you like to comment on that? I'm happy to make a comment there. Um, yeah, I agree totally with the association between open access and impact, absolutely. It was part of our presentation to research committee and academic board. Um, we posed the question, if European institutions are publishing OA and we're not, then how are we going to compete? Also, how are we going to work with them in the future? And that tended to resonate very strongly, I think, with that academic community. Yeah. Right. Um, I think most of the questions, uh, rest of the other comments in the chat relate to specific issues that have been answered, but we'll capture them and, and round it up with a blog on this as well. Mm. Okay. Well, uh, I'd just like to thank all our speakers and thank you, Ginny, uh, for being the MC. Uh, and I'd like to thank all the attendees for joining us today. And uh, we'll see you next time. Thank you. All the best.